Well, Larry Matthews, Dick Van Dyke fans are seriously excited because, well, I'm chatting with Richie Petrie. Hey, Craig, how are you, man? Oh, look, it is really fabulous to chat to you. And and usually I say zooming into somebody's Los Angeles home. But in this case, we're in Portland, Oregon, because you and your wife moved up there a couple of years ago. And as I understand it, living a fabulous life. We, we love it up here. It's fun. Listen, I was born and raised in L.A. and Burbank. And don't get me wrong, I love it. And it was great. And I, you know, had a wonderful, wonderful career and life there but it just at, at a point LA just got to be a little overwhelming in certain ways and when, when we were retired we knew we wanted to stay on the west coast but we wanted to be somewhere was a little more green and a kind of a little more you know kind of beautiful but it's uh, we love it up here we really do you think about the Dick Van Dyke show it is a bona fide tv classic it ran from 1961 to 1966 how old were you when you signed on well, when we started filming it, I was still five. I turned six in 61. So that's when we started filming. I was five years old. And yeah. And there's a fascinating story as to how you became involved, how you were cast as Richie. I'm one of seven children. So I'm number six out of seven. And my father was a musician in the Navy in World War II played with President Roosevelt. Anyway, there's a little bit of music and kind of mm -hmm. showbiz in our background. But I was the only one that just was always out there, just like being just like this really forward, outgoing, you know, just blah, 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 kid. So the mailman said to my mom, you know, listen, I think, you know, would Larry want to take acting lessons with this teacher who taught children primarily? And uh, her name was Lois Hauer. And um, my mom said, you know, ask me. And I went, yeah, it sounds like fun to me. I'm out, you know, I'm five years old. Sure, I'll do whatever. It doesn't matter. And um, then I would do that. She would hold showcases where agents would come to, um, you know, look at the skits we we're doing to see if they wanted to, you know, manage or, um, you know, basically represent somebody. And they wanted to represent me. And, you know, so they made a deal and, and we did got that all together. And then I went on an interview with Carl Reiner. Um, and, you know, as they say, the rest is history. It was kind of interesting um, it came down to me and another kid because you, you you know this, but your fans all tell that, that the Dick Van Dyke show, the pilot for the original show was not the Dick Van Dyke show. It was a show called Head of the Family, mm -hmm. which Carl Reiner wrote as him as the star because it's the story of Carl's life, really, uh, as a writer for um, Sid Caesar. So he wrote that and it didn't sell. And Sheldon Leonard um, saw it and went to Carl and said, look, uh, I think this is a great idea. It's a great show. Would you allow me to recast it? But you're not the guy to play him. So they got Dick and then they put us all together and, um, and we did the pilot. And like I said, after that, it, it went on and we probably could have gone on a few more years. But I think Carl said he hit a five years was a great run for him. He was happy. Dick had offers to do other things and he was going to do them one way or the other, whether we were doing a show or not. And kind of the consensus of everybody was just like, you know what? We've had a great hit. We've won more Emmy Awards than any other show on TV had won up until that time. And let's just end it on a high note. And and that's what we did. Now, is, yeah. is this true, Larry, that um, one of the, the, the deal clinches was you in Carl Reiner's office and he said, now, Larry, I want you to lie on that couch and pretend you've got this really bad tummy ache. That was it. It was because that in the in the pilot, I was sick. It was called The Sick Boy and the Sitter. And the conflict was Rob wanted to go to a party with Alan Brady. Laura didn't want to leave me alone because I was sick. And that was the conflict. But, yeah, I sat down and he goes, OK, so, you know, you're tummy really really hurts can you can you do that for me I'm like oh yeah my tummy hurts I was like a whiny little kid anyway and it was perfect and um and so it it came it's a there's a funny story you might not know which Jay Sandrich I don't know if you know who Jay Sandrich is oh ah, yes he was one of the greatest directors I worked on soap with him when he directed soap and Jay was just one of the most wonderful beautiful people I've ever known in my life Anyway, he was the assistant director for the Danny Thomas show or Make Room for Daddy. Yes. And Danny Thomas was one of our executive producers and Shell Leonard and Carl. And they were in a room together looking at my picture and this other kid's picture that they wanted. They were going back and forth. And, you know, Carl was leaning toward me because he wanted somebody that had never done anything in a business that they could just kind of like let become Richie. And so Jay Sandwich walked in to ask Danny Thomas a question about the show they were shooting for the Danny Thomas show that week. 
And as they, as Jay was about to leave the room, Danny said, wait, 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 Jay, come back, come back. He goes, which one of these kids should be, you know, Richie in our new Dick Van Dyke center in our new, in our new pilot. And he went that one and he pointed to my picture and Carl went, that's what I was doing anyway. And next thing I know I had the part. So it was kind of fun. Did any of your other siblings kind of have a yen towards showbiz? Did any of them do any bits and pieces or go on to become uh, somebody significant in the world of show? No, not really. Just me. What you find out, you know, Craig, and you know this, to make a living in the entertainment business is not as easy as everybody thinks it is. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody thinks, oh, you're, you know, you're, you're on TV, you're going to do this, you make millions. I didn't make millions, trust me, you know, never much. And so everybody thinks that it's such an easy thing to do, but it's just, it's a very, very difficult business to A, get into and B, survive in. Um, Absolutely. It, at some point after when I got out of my high school and I was going into college and I wanted to go back and act and and I went to the agents who you know, who had repped me and they said, sure, we'd, we'd be happy to send you on stuff. And I made up in all the pictures and photos and all that stuff. And they sent me on two interviews and I, you know, me, here I go. I'm like, well, I was Richie, man. I'm like, I was on an Emmy award winning show. I can get this. And I walk in and there's 50 people in there and it's a cattle call and it's depressing. And, you know, they sit there and they call you and you come and you go, and they, okay, read this. And I look and I go, read 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 blah 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 and they go great thank you very much bye and i'm like that's it i mean that's you know and it was very disheartening which is why i turned to the production post-production side of the business um and made my really career in that the competition is sometimes just so ferocious no matter where your talent is which leads me to this your embodiment of richard petrie you had enormous charisma you had the most incredible timing and this brilliant comedy prowess. Did that come naturally to you? I think a lot of it comes naturally because that's just, and me and, and all through my career, I've always kind of had that, like I said, you know, comedic kind of aspect of my life because life, even though it's serious and even though there's a lot of, you know, subjects that we, that, we approach in life as a very, um, like I said, serious. If you throw comedy in there, you can always make it better. You know, it's like, there's nothing like making people laugh. And I've said over the years that if I can just make somebody laugh during the day, my day is complete. And that's kind of where, what I grew up with. However, that being said, I also had an amazing teachers and cast around me. I mean, I had, Carl Reiner, who was a genius, you know, Sheldon Leonard, Dick Van Dyke, Mary was brilliant, Rosemary, mm. Maury Amsterdam, John Rich was our director, Jerry Paris, you know, and so I had these kind of already iconic figures in the business to then nurture that and to help me just bring that out even more. You know what I mean? I do. You certainly had some of the best lines in the show. And you talked about the joy of making people laugh. Did you know back then that you were making people laugh, that your character was having such an incredible impact? Because you look back on the Dick Van Dyke show now, and so much of that humour comes from Richie in the crazy things he says in his extraordinary observations of life. Um, yes, and and short answer. But again, the writing was amazing. So incredible. Carl... Uh, Sam Denoff, Bill Persky, all the writers on the show knew exactly, you know, how to write for the characters. And I re- realized very quickly that it was it, they were funny lines was because we filmed in front of a live audience. So I, I would hear the audience start to laugh and I'd kind of get a little bit of this in me and kind of try and fight it back, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I knew it was it was a line that people were going to laugh at and it was funny, but, but it was the writing was just so brilliant. All's I all's I really did, Greg, was just kind of be me playing Richie. I mean, that's kind of really what it was, which is if you look at it, Dick was Dick. You know, yes. that's what he's that type of person. Mary probably was the best actor performer. Rose and Maury were who they were. They were old vaudeville stars and they were just mm-hmm. great with that, you know. And so you learn from that aspect. And then Mary was just so wonderful to me because she would always kind of try and help me to just kind of get through little things or settle things or she would see me with the line and she'd come up and she'd say something. And Dick would do the same thing. 
but Mary especially. And then, and then John Rich and Jerry Paris, they were just, they were just wonderful people. And uh, I really, and you know, I, I'm so blessed to have been part of just the, the most amazing group of people at that time who, who, who did their job because they love their job. You know, nowadays in our entertainment business, it's all money, money. I mean, look at the actor strike. Look at the writer strike. It's just, you know, it's all about bottom line, dollars, dollars, dollars. Who can get this? How much can I make? It doesn't matter whether the product's crap or not. They just put it out there because it's all corporate. And when we were doing our shows back in the 60s and 70s, when all those shows were there, they were done because people was, it was their passion and they loved doing it. And that's what they did. They made money. Great. If they were, if they made, you know, some fame, great. But that wasn't their motivation. You talked about Dick Van Dyke and he was very nurturing to you. What exactly was he like to work with? I mean, was he, as you saw him on screen, was he kind of like this goofy, tall, lanky, fun-loving, fabulously big-hearted person? He was, in general. When the camera roll, he, you know, exemplified it. He brought it out more, so it was very much more animated. But when the camera was off, that was Dick. He was just a really fun person to be around always never had a bad word you know he's just always in a good mood always encouraging mm -hmm. and just fun to be around you know really and still is he's 97 larry and still going strong i know he recently signed on uh, to do a bit in days of our lives and he and his wife arlene just have the most divine marriage and they're so joyous and their little videos make so many people laugh he really is one of those one of a kind special people he is and and as you said and i said he just loves to make people happy i mean that's just, i can't put it any other way really that's just dick do you keep in touch with him from time to time i do uh arlene and i uh you know trade you know little messages back here on facebook and and text and stuff sometimes and i'll be down in uh in, in burbank october 7th and 8th at the hollywood autograph show signing autographs there and uh, I plan to make a visit to go out and visit Dick and see him for a bit. And so, yeah, that's going to be great. I'm looking forward to that. What was Mary Tyler more like as a person, as you found as a young kid? Mary was um, because we started, I was playing her son, she's my mother. So we kind of had that bond as a mother kind of yeah. son kind of thing going on. You could always see that she was just wanting to learn and to do better and to develop herself into a better actor performer mother role all that stuff right and um and you know when they first started the show carl was looking for so many people he interviewed and he find found mary and she read one one line for him and he went oh my god you're it and he took her into danny and shell and said i found our laura petri and uh and so they wrote for her but very quickly into the series carl realized what a comedic sense she had and how great she was at actually doing comedy. Comedy is one of the hardest things to do and pull off correctly. Serious acting, you know, we can all be that sometimes, but comedy is a whole different world. And then they start, Carl started to write more and more and more for her to be in those comedic, you know, um, um, scenes and situations and things like that. And she was just brilliant at it. I mean, I, I watch the shows now, you know, and I just look and go like, man, these guys were really good. Man. Yes. Yeah. Incredible. And then, of course, she went on to star in the Mary Tyler Moore show. And I think really the slug line of that summed her up. She could turn the world on with her smile. And yet behind that smile, as you well know, Larry, was so much sadness, wasn't it? Her assorted struggles, alcoholism that she was very candid about. And then... Mary went to Helen back with her diabetes and then getting the brain tumour and her death back in, I think it was 2017. How did that knock you around knowing that she was kind of like your mum? Wasn't she back when you were a young kid, your your TV mum? It was sad for me. Um, you know, in her book, at one point, she said when we were doing the show, she felt like I was more of a son to her than her own son at, at times. And that was, of course, made me very, you know, made me feel really special. But it was hard to watch that knowing diabetes, having watched people go through these kind of diseases. I mean, it was really hard. But when we did the Dick Van Dyke Revisited show, which was in 2004, we were doing a scene and I was on the phone with Alan Brady. And we were at a break one day and Mary 
came up to me. She says, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you and, and tell you something. I said, well, thank you very much. She goes, you're really, really brilliant. Mm. She goes, I mean, you are fantastic. She says that what you're doing on a phone is one of the hardest things to pull off in comedy and do it right. She goes, and you are brilliant. And I said, well, no, thanks, Mary. I mean, I try my, she goes, no, you're not listening to me. You're brilliant. She goes, and I'm so proud of you and so proud of the man you become and your career. Cause she knew I was in post-production and made a big career in that. And it was kind of that last moment that I got to share with her and it just, to this day, I'll just carry that with me forever. It was so, so special and so wonderful. And uh, it meant the world. Somebody else with whom you had an astonishing connection uh, was Rose Marie. I mean, wonderful as the wisecracking Sally Rogers, of course. And as you referenced when we first started chatting, she was one of those, you know, old fashioned vaudeville troopers who'd been around since, you know, the year dot. She seemed to people from the outside, a truly lovely person. Was she? I love Rosemary. I loved her so much. Our families were pretty close because we're both Italians, you know. Yes. And so we had that connection going. Her husband, unfortunately, who died when we she was on the show and he was a wonderful guy. His name's Bobby Guy. And just a sweetheart of a man, her, her daughter. So we were kind of close with our families and we had that Italian connection. But Rosemary and I have the same birthday. We're both born on August 15th. And she was like an aunt. I mean, she was truly like another part of a family for me. And after the show, I probably saw Rose more than any of the cast, actually, because she lived in Van Nuys. I lived in Burbank and we would see each other. And, and she did a documentary on her life and it was a really wonderful documentary and she asked me to go to the first screening and I couldn't make it so they had another screening and she literally called me and she says well, please please come I really want you to come and I did and I'm so glad I did because she died like literally within the next four or five months after that mm. and um she was there and I came up to her and I hugged her and you know again we had that moment to close closure in life where she just said, I love you so much. I've always loved you, always love you. And I think you're the most wonderful person. And I said the same thing to her. And again, then she died months later. And and uh, so, yeah, but she was really special to me. Do you ever feel her around you, Larry? Do you feel that she's still there, you know, just overseeing what you're doing and making sure you're happy in that kind of mumsy Italian way? Yes, but I, it, sometimes I do think it's funny. And I I have, I have dream. I'm one of these people that dreams all the time. And I've had dreams about her. And like, she's just with me like now. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I do feel kind of that. But more importantly, I think I just feel her influence and in how I developed as a person and some of the advice over the years she gave me and helped me. And I bring that every day into, you know, as part of how I, I am and conduct myself and yes and just be who I am. What was the significance of the black bow in the hair? I'm sure there's something to that. There is. Um, it was when her husband died. She always wore a bow, but when Bobby died and she was actually going to leave the show and um, John Rich went and spent all night talking her out of leaving the show. And so the bow then became black. What a beautiful story with regard to Rosemary and her late husband and, and the black bow. Um, there is a funny kind of conspiracy theory, and you wouldn't imagine that Richie Petrie would have a conspiracy theory raging around him, but there is a connection between Richie and, of all people, John Bon Jovi, and it's like Elvis is still alive and stacking shelves at a 7-Eleven somewhere. <laughs> uh, is this quite? Is this true, Larry, that there is this thing where some people think that Richie Petrie actually was John Bon Jovi? Quite a few years ago, um... I, I guess I, who knows how it got, you know, internet, there's all kinds of false nonsense going out there. Um, but somebody had put out there that I was, Richie was John Bon Jovi was Richie and it was a big thing going on. And so this uh, station in Boston contacted me and they said, Hey, we're going to do an interview with, because, you know, we hear that, you know, <laughs> you're, you're John Bon Jovi. I said, well, no, you know, and they kind of knew what they kind of was going to be. So we went on, we did an interview and it was kind of fun. We kind of dispelled all the rumors. And then Bon Jovi came on the interview at the end and we kind of had some chats with him and some laughs and it was very funny. Um, but yeah, there's so many crazy stuff out there, Craig. 
that gets put out. I, you know, I don't know where it comes from. Hey, you know, it's crazy. But, no. but so long as you can have a laugh, you know, if it's not damaging you and you can have a bit of a laugh. I mean, heck, if somebody said I was really John Bon Jovi, I'd be terribly flattered. I just wish I could do something with my hair. That's all. Well, I wish I had hair to do with, yes, but that's another story. <laughs> Carl Reiner, of course, not only the creator and, I mean, one of the most incredible writers, as you reference. I mean, also his characterization of Alan Brady, the egomaniacal TV host, with the absolutely terrible toupee, all of which is just fabulous comedy in itself. What was the bones of the man like? What was the real Carl Reiner like that you got to know so well? There's not enough time to say for me how wonderful of a person Carl Reiner was in general. Again, always in a good mood, always, you know, looking for things to make people laugh and enjoy and, and just do some great stuff to entertain. And Carl was that person that you know, I would see him and then I wouldn't see him for a couple, three, four years or whatever. And every time he would always come to me and give me a big hug and kiss me on the head and say, I, you know, and just tell me he loves me. And that was Carl. And and um, when we did that reunion show I was talking about, and I did the the part that Mary complimented me on. It was funny. I, I did the first thing and, and Carl goes, well, I could see he was kind of like trying to figure something out. I said, Carl, tell me what you want me to do. I mean, give me what wh who's Richie what is he doing what's going on and he told me he says look here's Richie this that this doesn't care about Alan Brady blah 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 made his father's life miserable just that just we rehearsed the thing the next time and he went that's perfect and 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 at one point after we were doing a show he turned to me he says you're so good at this he goes have you what have you been doing you've been acting and I said well I'm a salesman Carl so I act every day but you know and um and he says no 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 but you're so so good at this he goes gosh I guess I really knew what I was doing when I picked you for the part huh and it was so funny that he said that it was just again a wonderful wonderful compliment to me but yeah just just the most wonderful human being I just can't say enough about him and don't you think his son Rob Reiner is such a chip off the old block in many ways? Very, very much so. And you know, I know Rob again when I was sure Rob <laughs> used to used to read me comic books in my dressing room on the set. Rob was just again, he is a lot like his dad, a real chip off the old block. Uh, you know, comes, you know, it's in it's in the genes, man. It just comes right when it's there, it's there. And and Rob's great and. Again, another really wonderful man, you know. Funny bit of trivia that I picked up, and maybe this is just a bit of rubbish off the internet because there's plenty of that to be had. But do you own the desk that Carl's character, Alan Brady, used to use? I did. It's now in the Comedy Museum in Jamestown, um, um, New York. Yes. So it's the Lucia Ball Comedy Museum, which I gave to them about five years ago. Yes. Um, because... We were moving and I just didn't have room for it at one point. But I mean, thing is massive. Yeah, and it's cool. a funny story how I came about that. I was working for Ron Jacobs, who was our associate producer, when I got out of college at UCLA. And they had a big stage at MGM where um, Thomas Leonard Productions, which did numerous shows, you know, Andy Griffith and Make Room for Daddy and on and on and on and on. Um, and they had all this furniture from the sets stored in this big studio in MGM and Ronnie came one day and said hey look MGM wants our studio back so we got to get all this stuff out of there and then uh, we'll, we rented another storage unit so me and a guy who was working with me his name was Chet um, we went down and we literally moved the entire three days we moved every piece of furniture from all these shows out and into a storage unit and uh, Ronnie said look if there's something you guys want just take it I don't care it's you know whatever you want and Chet said, you know, there's a really great desk there. And like, okay, great. And I looked and I didn't have a desk. And it was, it was, it weighs a ton, Craig. It weighs a ton. It was old style, really, you know, put together well furniture, right? So we lugged this, got it in. And it was a chair that went with it and that Alan's had in. And I had it in my house for years and years and years from apartment to apartment when I got married and this and that. And I didn't even know what it was. And one day... I'm sitting at my desk with a little TV on there, right? And aside looking. And and um, uh, the the show about Mary telling Coast to Coast Big Mouth came yeah. on, which is where Mary tells the world that Alan Brady's bald. Yes. I'm watching this and I'm watching the scene with the wigs and I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm going, hey, that's my desk. <laughs> I have Alan Brady's desk. 
And I'm like, wait a minute. And I looked and I checked the doors. I'm like, this is Alan Brady's desk. I can't believe I've had this all years. I didn't even know it was, right? And I had it forever and ever and ever. And it was just, it's a wonderful piece. And then about 2018, 19, I basically donated it to the, uh, to the museum at Jamestown for the Comedy Museum, which they have a whole uh, wing dedicated for Carl Reiner because he was instrumental in starting it. I wonder what ever happened to Alan Brady's old hair pieces. Who knows? I <laughs> I wouldn't. Don't be surprised if they're not around somewhere. Trust me, that somebody has them. Maury Amsterdam, of course, as Buddy um, Sorrell, the joke writer for um, Alan Brady's show. I read it somewhere that uh, that character was really based very loosely on the great Mel Brooks. Is that right? Do you know? Yes. Yes, it is. Because wow. again, when Carl wrote it, that character was based on Mel. Um, Rosemary's character was based on Selma Diamond, who was yes. the other writer with them that worked on the show. And Maury was the perfect fit for that because he's the human joke machine, right? Yes. And Maury was like that, always was like that, is, was, and till the end was like that to the point where give example we were at dick van dyke had a star on hollywood boulevard and we got all invited for the ceremony and the whole thing right that right so i put the star in there i have actually have a picture of dick me carl sheldon leonard and maury amsterdam leaning in front of the star as they put it on hollywood boulevard that's pretty special and we went to the the luncheon at the roosevelt hotel which is a famous old hotel in hollywood yeah and i sat next to maury and i'm telling you craig it was just one liner after another at his age. It was like, it was like, you know, Hey, you know what this is? You know what this is? You know, I mean, it was just Maury was Maury. He was so amazing. And he was so great to be around another guy that just never had a bad word to say about anybody. You had a tutor on set, obviously that's how things work. You know, you're working whatever your long hours were, so you can't get to school, but then in breaks and hiatuses and so forth, you would go back to your regular school. Was that kind of a weird experience? It was horrible. Um, <laughs> um, why? Because I skipped a grade because I was a private tutor. So I went from first to third grade. So I never, you know, I was because private tutor, you learn so quickly and they skip me up to grade. So I was always, and, and kids at that age are very, it's a whole different world. They're cruel and they're just, you know, and, you know, and, and so I was a year younger. And so the times I went back in my grade school, um, it was not a great experience. I, I just, I, you know, and, and even though I had two brothers that were older than me that were in the school, um, it just seemed to be, it just, and, you know, Catholic school, the nuns, because I wasn't there most of the year, then the nuns would pick me out and, you know, mm -hmm. zero in on me to like, you know, you know, just to make examples out of, you know, all that nonsense until I got to high school. And when I went to high school, everything changed. It was a whole nother world because I came into it as this person. And, and instead of people being upset or, you know, oh, you're just a kid that's never here. He's a special kid, whatever. They were all like, oh man, you're Richie. That's really cool. And we, and that, and that was a, just a great experience, but yes. my grade school was not a great experience for me. Well, I got to say you're far from alone, Larry, as you would well know, because a lot of child stars found themselves when they would return to uh, regular schooling on the end of bullying because they were perceived as being privileged and so forth and given special treatment. And so they were brought down a peg or two. It's really quite uh, awful. And I'm sad you went through that, but I'm sure it hardens you up for, for life in the future. Bit of astounding trivia. Richie had a rather unusual middle name. Uh, and if I'm correct, that was Rosebud. Do you know correct. why Richie was Rosebud? I do. So the episode was what's in a middle name and how I got the middle name Rosebud. And when Richie found out he was Rosebud, he goes, oh, that's, I'm, it's a sissy's name. I hate that. And blah, blah, blah. He was really depressed about it. So Rob sat him, sat him down and told him the story of why he became Rosebud. The story was that all the relatives wanted their Richie's middle name to be after them. And Rob wasn't going to there were seven relatives, RCB, RCB, right? Seven relatives. And so the 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 letter, each letter of Rosebud stands for a different name of one of the uncles and, and uncles and or relatives that wanted Richie to be named after them. 
an absolutely beautiful story. And you see, to dispel another rumour going around on the internet, nothing to do with Citizen Kane and that last line of... <laughs> <laughs> nothing at all. Correct. I made that bit up, Larry. I made that bit up. The That's dick, brilliant. The Dick Van Dyke show, of course, was shot at the now iconic Desilu Studios. Did you ever get to see Lucille Ball around and about? Oh, yeah, absolutely. She would come over. You know what she would do? She was funny. I mean, she was intimidating. You know, Lucy was a very, very, um, she was brilliant and a wonderful comedic actress and a great actress in general, and a, but a force in our industry. I mean, a huge force oh. in our industry. And so she was a little intimidating. So a lot of times when they knew, people knew that Lucy was coming, they would just kind of scatter. They would just disappear. So they didn't have to be around when Lucy was around. But she would <laughs> stealth herself up and she would go up into the catwalks above, above you know, the stages. And she'd just sit up there and just watch and look down and watch. And then she'd come down and she'd make her comments and do things like that. It was, you know, it was just, it was Lucy. But yeah, we de I definitely got to, you know, see her several times during the years. Absolutely. And you became great friends with Ron Howard, who, of course, was on the Desilu uh, stages filming um, the Andy Griffith show. Correct. Well, Ron and I were both born in Burbank. Um, and we knew the families knew and, and, you know, his dad, Rance and, and Clint and Ron and I played little league together, actually little league baseball together. Um, and so we were, you know, we, we knew each other pretty well. Um, and then as the shows ended and time went on, then we didn't see each other, for, you know, at all really. And then, uh, one time I was at universal working on a, at a post-production facility and Ron was across the way. And I saw him outside. I went up and I said, Ron, it's it's Larry Mazzi. And he goes, oh, man, how are you? And we had a Kais not night moment for about 10, 15 minutes and just chatted. And he goes, I remember playing Little League when you got your because I was sitting behind a kid warming up and he hit me in the, in the mouth with a bat and took two of my teeth out. And so that was, Ron remembered that. And my mom was like, oh, my God, my son's got it too. He's got to be on television. It's like, what's going to happen? Thank God they were baby teeth, but anyway. Uh, Bill Cosby, see, it's funny that path life takes you on talking about sports and things as a kid. Uh, he too was on on those sound stages doing the Cosby show and he taught you how to play football or something, didn't he? Well, he taught me how to throw a football. Him and myself and him and Robert Culp and we'd get out there and do three ways sometimes throwing the football around the studio. It was really fun. And, you know, listen, I we all know we all know everything that's going on I can only speak to my experience and Bill was a wonderful guy to me. And, and so was Robert. And, you know, so that's my memories. Goma Pyle, of course, was shot there. The Joey Bishop show. You're in the middle of this kind of like a uh, hurricane of, of what are now iconic TV shows that were all shot around the Desilu sound stages. Jim was again, the most kindest, gentlest person in the world. I love going over the set. Because what happened was we were on stage eight. Uh, Danny Thomas, Maker for Danny, was shot on stage nine. And when they finished, while we were still going, they moved Gomer Pyle into that stage. Yeah. So I go over there and I got to know Ronnie Shell really well and Frank Sutton really well and, and Jim Neighbors. And they were all such great, great people. Joy Bishop and I were very close for many, many years. Um, and uh, it was a great, it was such a, again, I mean, I just, it was just a blessed life. I mean, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have been given the opportunity to be in a situation where I got to meet so many wonderful, wonderful people over the years. Uh, you look back to your role as Richie and you were as cute as a Bugsy. You had this unbelievable wealth of talent and great comic timing as we've discussed and all of that for you just came so naturally. But I'm just wondering why as a kid that you didn't just step from one show to the next to the next? Kind of a combination of things. I mean, the Dick Van Dyke show was like my childhood. I mean, I, you know, I always tell people I went from age five to 15 in five years because you grew up around adults mm. and, you know, you just soak in everything around them and it was just wonderful. Um, and yet, it, and, and as much as I loved that, it was very sad for me when it ended and, and very sad. I remember crying at the rap show. Cause I, I was the realization to me that I wasn't going to see these people anymore for who knows when, you know? And, um, and so I kind of was okay with just going back and 
being with my family and my brother, you know, and brothers and getting into playing sports and just doing that kind of stuff that I didn't really grow up doing in those years. So it was kind of like, it was okay. I did some theater. I continued, I did some little theater here and there and some volunteer theater stuff down in Hollywood and a few shows that, and then I was a theater arts major at UCLA. Um, and, um, you know, I just felt that it was okay to take that break. And then the, the, as you know, the problem is when you take that break for a while and try and get back, then, you know, the show business is like this, man. If you're not in front, it's just, you're, you know, Oh, who's he, what's, you know, it just, just happens. Uh, I'm fortunate that the Dick Van Dyke show is one of the most iconic and, and greatest shows in TV. And, and it's lasted the test of time over decades and decades and decades and that then people still enjoy it so i can still kind of have a little bit of contact and connect with the people through that which makes me really happy but your reference the dick van dyke show revisited uh, and everyone who was alive was there did that not whet the appetite a little larry did you not think to yourself gosh Maybe it's 2004, a lot of water under the bridge. Maybe I could give it another crack. I, I mean, I can't deny it. I, I mean, I loved it and it was it was great. And, and it did make me feel like I wanted to do more. But, you know, at that point, Craig, I was pretty much, you know, entrenched in what I did. I mean, I was, you know, I was, again, my first job to make my living and to, to make a career was what I had built for all those yeah. years you know, before that. So I did a few little guest things here and there for people that I knew were doing short films or film and they asked me to do little parts here and there. And I love that. Um, but it's just, it's, you know, my focus and my energy was just taken up by my, my career doing that. And so it just kind of went that way. And now, yes, would I love to do more right now? Absolutely. Would I welcome it? Absolutely. Would I, you know, like I said, really just, be thrilled to be able to do some parts here and there. Yes, indeed. Um, we'll see what happens. You know, you just kind of take life as it turns you and you kind of go with what it goes with and try and make the best you can and what makes you happy. Speaking of making people happy, uh, you certainly have made millions around the world with the Dick Van Dyke show. But in 1987, you married Jennifer, who is your wife. And here we are, what, 36 years on. How did you two meet? Was Jennifer involved in the biz somehow? No, it's funny. It's a crazy story. Um, I was um, working at a, a, a lab called CFI. And we had an optical department. It was one of the film labs in LA. It was one of the, the bigger labs. And so um, the guy running the optical department had met these girls. And he said, look, these girls are part of this, what they call this business forum. It was a networking thing where they would get together and they would do um, you know, uh, charity events and, and you know, help with that. We did a big thing for Make-A-Wish, which was really nice, raised a lot of money for them. And so I went to his house to one of these parties and the parties where you had to come and bring somebody that you weren't involved with. So of the opposite sex. So, um, you know, um, it just, I just met her at that and we just kind of, you know, it was fun. We got, you know, we hit it off a little bit. And then later that year they had a Halloween party and, um, I went to that and, um, the costume she was wearing was pretty cool it was like this sexy kind of devil thing and I was dressed as Elvira and uh you know and we just kind of connected at that party and then it kind of took off after that really and and it's funny because I remember when we were dating and going out before we got married and somebody talked to her you know said you know before we actually really started dating she goes oh you you should go out with Larry he's a really good guy and she goes oh he's just another Hollywood hypester I don't want to go out with those kind of people right because she was working in a, in a securities business you know in a in a you know stock stock business and securities business and and so it was we were kind of opposite and the opposites attract and going to be 37 years coming up in February so here we are and she's the most wonderful person in the world and it's just been a it's just been a great ride. I know. Congratulations to you both. Uh, you know, you you you. I, I there's just something about you. I I really kind of get. It's fabulous. And I read something about you two attending a Halloween party. She went as Sunny, and you went as Cher. Correct. I've got to say we that Elvira that. wig came in very handy, didn't it? Oh yeah, we used it a while. One of our <laughs> best ones was uh, Ike and Tina Turner. She <laughs> went as Ike Turner, and I went as Tina. And that 
that we won first prize that night, hands down. That was a great one. You see, it variety is the spice of life, and I think that it's fabulous if you can kind of swap roles and do things that are a little unconventional. It makes life interesting, doesn't it? Exactly, it does. It's just like, just you know, be creative, have fun, do something that's different, just enjoy. You know, we're only here once, man, and we don't know how long we're going to be here. And I've unfortunately, I've known too many people that I've gone to college with and dear friends that, you know, have died early. And so you just kind of say, you know, what the, what the heck, man, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it out there and have a great time. And that's it. Okay. So let us in on, on, on a secret with Halloween looming, who might you go to this year? I don't know yet. We haven't really, it's funny. We, we, this is the second year we, well, it'll be the third Halloween we've been up here for. And, um, the first year we were kind of getting ready to go away. We went away for three months right after that. So it wasn't kind of thing last year. Um, we just were getting into our new place cause we just bought a new place up here. And so this year, now that we've networked, we know a lot more people here. I'm sure there's going to be a party and yeah, it's an interesting thing. I'll have to think about that one. We'll see, we'll see what comes up. Who knows? Now, Larry, any plans for a memoir? I mean, all these decades on the Dick Van Dyke show continues to be so loved. Uh, it is and rightly so, a bona fide TV icon. Everybody is fascinated with what went on behind the scenes and what the stars were really like. So, I mean, you know, you're in the box seat. You could tell it. You've given me beautiful stories during the course of our chat now. So, I mean, could you be tantalised to drag out the keyboard and uh, and tap away? Yeah, I really need to. Uh, I've been told by several people that, you know, I've had offers from publishers that if I wrote it, they would publish it. And, and it's, it's not only is it the Dick Van Dyke show, Craig, but it's my whole career in the entertainment business, even after that, that's, yes. that's as fascinating and maybe sometimes a little more in certain ways, obviously starting with the Dick Van Dyke show and giving me that, that, you know, um, boost into the, to the business, which I needed and which I'm just so thankful for. But Yes, I need to do that. I'm, I'm as, as um, my wife, Jennifer keeps telling me, she goes, you're never going to do it. And I'm like, because I'm just lazy. I have to sit down and write to them. I mean, I got to really think about this and write it. But I really do need to. And hopefully over the next two or three years, I'll get that all done and we'll put that out there. But like I said, there's so many fascinating uh, things just through my whole life. I mean, the people I, I mean, Frank Capra Jr. I got to meet when I was, you know, working at CFI. I mean, the people I've come across, Bill Bixby, who I did a TV movie with, the first movie I, I did out of, you know, as a assistant to the producer kind of thing, and mm -hmm. all these things that have gone on over the years, and yeah, I, I, I need to do that, and I, I, I hope, I'm trying to motivate myself to just get it going. So yeah. Good. Well, I I hope that uh, I hope that just uh, re reaffirming it now in your mind uh, is giving you that little bit of impetus to get it happening. Has anybody ever left you absolutely starstruck over all of these decades in the business, be it in front of the cameras or not? You know, being on sound stages. Has there ever been any one person that even you've gone, oh my gosh, you know, they've left you kind of breathless or you think now they really have that star factor? There's a couple over the years. I just mentioned one, which is Frank Capra Jr. Yes. When I met him at the, at the, he was going in to see dailies, rushes, you call them from a movie we were doing. And I just was kind of like, I'm like, I just have to like shake your hand. I mean, this is Frank Capra, you know? And knowing, you know, the history of the industry and the other one. And I met in Westwood um, out in front of a theater when I was um, living down there at UCLA was Groucho Marx. Oh, wow. And um, and it was just and he was it was so funny because they had just reissued Animal Crackers. It hadn't been seen for decades and decades. And it was at a theater in Westwood. And here I am, you know, you know college student probably smoking weed that day and having a good time walking down to Westwood <laughs> and um, and I saw Groucho in the car and I'm like I have to go say something to him this is one of my idols of of life and I went up and and I sat there for about you know five ten minutes talking to him and sweet man wonderful very humble um but just you're right. I just kind of like I was almost like, uh, you know, to, to see Groucho. And 
you know, and there's other people that I've been around that I've admired a lot, you know, in terms of their accomplishments in the industry and what they've done. Um, but I wouldn't say they they just left me to that point where I'm like, oh my God, here's Groucho Marx. You know, <laughs> it's like one of those. Oh yeah, that's one of those absolute wow moments. Now, speaking of wow moments, uh, you love wine and I think this is a fabulous thing. It's the elixir of life, they say. And this is a great opportunity for fans of yours to actually get to meet you because where you are in Portland, Oregon, uh, you're going, which is not far from some really fabulous uh, vineyards of the world, uh, you're going to be conducting tours of some really wonderful wineries. Is this correct? Is a little birdie telling me the right things in my shell like here? Yeah. yeah, little birdies whispered the right thing into yeah. your ear there. That's okay. The nectar of the gods, we call it, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, been into wines, I mean, 45 years. I've just been, it's just a passion of mine. Uh, when I got up here at the Willamette Valley, which is, as you said, one of the, the premier producers mm -hmm. of wine in the world. Um, and I've wanted to do something in the wine business all my life, but going back and we said it just, I was focusing so much on other things. And now that I'm not, I thought, what can I do? So I partnered with a gentleman who has a company called a great Oregon wine tour, and you can go out and go with Richie Petri into the Willamette Valley, who will guide you through and do some tours and tastings with you, sign an autograph or two for you, tell you some stories and that's what we're doing. I'm just really upset that I live in Australia and you're in Oregon and all of this good stuff is happening there. I need to get on a plane, Larry, and join one of those tours. Come on over, buddy. It's all good. We'll, we'll be ready for you anytime you want. Larry Matthews, can I just say it truly has been a joy chatting with you. I've enjoyed our time very much. It's fun because it's nice to have somebody who really, like you said, knows and can talk about topics that not a lot of people know about, which is fun for me to then elaborate on and kind of bring to the public and to the fans. You are a joy. I hope one of these days we get to meet face to face. Thanks, Thank Greg. you, Thanks, Larry. Well, pleasure meeting you both. Take care, you guys. Bye. Bye.